Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. We have a very special episode today featuring a few of our Global Autism Project staff and partners. Actually, more than a few. There are a total of 13 people in this episode. This conversation offers a glimpse into the deeply rooted relationships of our global autism community. Here's a little bit of context. For over 17 years, the Global Autism Project has partnered with international autism centers to provide sustainable clinical, administrative, and leadership training. Three times a year, we've sent Skill Corps volunteer teams to our partner sites around the world to work directly with their local teachers and therapists. When COVID-19 hit, we were forced to cancel all international travel and innovate new programs to stay afloat as an organization. Throughout this time, we've continued to meet with our partners every month over large Zoom calls. It's always fun to see a mosaic of faces from across the globe on a single screen. We recently thought it would be exciting for our followers on social media to join a call with our partners. So during our meeting last week, we went live on Facebook and our partners shared the impact that the pandemic has had on their centers, the current situation in their respective countries, and some positive takeaways they've gained from the crisis. The audience was able to follow along and contribute questions in real time. Our CEO and founder, Molly Ola Pinney, led the discussion between some of our staff and eight of our partners, many of which you might recognize from previous episodes. They called in from Kenya, India, China, Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Rwanda. We had originally scheduled a different episode for this week, However, right after we hung up, we realized that the content of our call was really worth sharing with you as well. As one could expect from a live call with 13 participants from 13 different locations across the world, we had some sound issues, but we've done our best to correct them for this podcast. Just a reminder that you can find this conversation and all our interviews on our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project. In this episode, discover what's possible when a global community is built on resilience. For more information about our work, please visit globalautismproject.org. And now, I present you, our Global Autism Partners. Oh, we're so live. Amazing. Excellent. How exciting. Welcome. My name is Molly. I'm the founder and CEO of the Global Autism Project, and I'm joined today with our partners and team from around the world. So I'll give everyone just a chance to introduce themselves, where they are, who they're connected with, and we'll start up here with Pooja. Hi, everyone. How are you? I am Pooja Panesser, Director at Kaizora Center for Neurodevelopmental Therapies in Kenya and also for Kaisara Child Development Center in Tanzania. I'm a board-certified behavior analyst and been a partner with the Global Autism Project for over 10 years. <laughs> a long time. Excellent. Chong, one of our team members, where are you? Hey, guys. My name is Chong, and currently I am in Vietnam, Southeast Asia, working with you guys all around the world. We are indeed the Global Autism Project. I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Rachel. Hey everyone, I am here from Barcelona, Spain, and I started off as a school corps volunteer, was the regional coordinator of Europe last year, and now hosting the podcast. Yeah, awesome. Mandy. Hey, <laughs> uh, not very exotic. I'm in South Carolina. <laughs> I am the skill corps coordinator, so I am anxiously waiting, getting all of our volunteers together again to be able to travel internationally. So. Hopefully next year. Yeah, we will travel again. And Cassie. Hey, everybody. I'm Cassie. I'm also in South Carolina. 
I started as a Skill Corps member and I am the director of outreach. So I get to work with all these people on this call right now on outreach initiatives in their community. I miss traveling to all of you. Excellent. Sangeeta. Hi, I'm Sangeeta from Chandigarh, which is the northern part of India. And uh, we were we associated with Global Autism since now 10 years, more than 10 years. I believe we are the one of the first partners. And this has been a very incredible, beautiful journey for us. I work with the Institute Sorum, where we had 170 students before the lockdown. So it's really, uh, you know, wonderful to connect today. Awesome. Rani. Okay, everyone. My name is Rani. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, I know about Global Ocean Project from 2013 and become officially partnership from 2017. Thank you. Awesome. Maffer. Hi, I'm Maria Chan, or most known as Maffer because of my first name and second name. I am the director of Centro Enigma in Ecuador in South America, December 2018. Excellent. Yasser. Hi, everyone. My name is Yasser. I am the founder and clinical director of Namai Center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. We have been partnering with Global Citizen Project since 2018. Amazing. And Michael. Yeah. yeah, hi, my name is Michael Huang. I'm from uh, U Plus Academy from China. We have been working with uh, Global Arts and Project from two, uh, for more than three years. I think this is uh, 30 years. We really have enjoyed a lot and we learned a lot and benefited a lot, uh, not only for us, but also for many other Chinese teachers, parents in China. Incredible. So excited to have you all here. So we have a few partners who may pop in later, who may not, but we have partners also in the Dominican Republic and Rwanda and Nigeria and another partner in India. So we may see them as well, but thank you guys for being here. And I just wanted to start out, you know, it occurred to us a few weeks ago to our team that we're so fortunate to get to talk with you all. We've been in communication since COVID started impacting all of our businesses. In fact, in some ways, we sort of watched COVID move across the globe via these calls. You know, I remember the calls back in January when our partners in China were in quarantine and we were we were not yet. And then it, it sort of over time. And then we finally had a call, I think, in March and April, where every single one of us was in quarantine all over the world. So we've really gotten to see and feel the global impact that COVID has had on all of us. I would just love to have a few of you, and you can decide who shares, just share what the impact has been of having to, so first of all, as I said, every center that we've worked with has had to close down for a period of time, wherever in the world we are. That probably comes as no surprise as also the Global Autism Project office in the US had to close down. So yeah, I would love to hear just what has that impact been? And anybody who wants to speak up, remind us where you are and what that's meant for you. Well, in Ecuador, we because we're in Latin America, we were kind of like the last people who, who, who in the whole train of COVID-19. But in my city specific, and I, I spoke this to the team when we had the, the talks in Zoom, uh, my city was very, very affected. We were in quarantine, which, I mean, the quarantine has, is just lifting up this week, but finally it's lost their job. Um, all our kids stop services. We couldn't even do services at home. Um, I have a few families who are from rural places, very a very rural place, who lost um, the mother lost her job and she has three kids and one of her kids has autism and she has to go back and live in her own town in the rural place. We're trying to see how we can help her out, but it was really hard for her. There was. Not a lot of people have internet connection here, especially people who are in rural places. So even we we were wanting to help with telehealth sessions, it was really difficult to do that. We try to manage it. Also, our staff had to give up their salary. Um, we lost staff. We lost kids. We closed one site in another city for a short period of time, and this is since last month. We're trying to like keep up. From now on, but not all the parents have recovered their job because when people are still doing telework, 
So because they're doing telework, even though they have more work to do, uh, the government decides to pay less to those people who are working from home. So probably from the a family of four, where there's a mother, a father, and kids, probably one of them lost their job and another one of them decreased their salary. So it's been really hard for their parents. And so obviously uh, people lost family members and it's another expense there too. So that's how we are right now in in the city that Centro Enigma is. Got it. Got it. Who else wants to share the impact that it's had where you are? I can go. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Total quarantine or total curfew in, in April, and that lasts for like almost three months. So we had, like, we start losing the amount of time that we can dedicate to services, then suddenly we lost all the time we can work with kids. We are now, the whole country, under like a total curfew. So that caused a lot of problems. The first one is our kids lost their access to the services. Also caused a lot of problems regarding how the business is working, the money, the expenses that still nagging and coming every day. So it was a very difficult time for us. After three months, thanks God now everything starts opening. They start opening gradually and now we are functioning as usual with a lot of precautions. We managed to keep some free online sessions for our kids at the beginning of the total curfew. So we make sure that the parents have a guidelines or a roadmap how to navigate the few difficult weeks to come. Got it. Excellent. That's one thing I think that really impressed all of us and didn't surprise any of us was how incredible you all were at adapting and making things work for parents and doing telehealth, even in places where people don't have computers, doing things via text and WhatsApp and all that. And I think that it just speaks to, you know, we often say about our partners that it's not about your resources, it's about your resourcefulness. And your resourcefulness was so throughout all of this, and I know we're still in it, but in the in the beginning and still is, was just one of the most incredible things to see. And, and it, I was very confident that this team, this Global Autism Project family is going to stay together and weather this. And I think in a lot of ways, because you're used to being resourceful and resilient, it helped in a lot of ways. Pooja, do you want to speak to what, if any, assistance local governments offered you and, and other people? Sure. So personally, for Kaizora, we did not receive government support. Having said that, as a private organization, there's not much that we can apply for because being private, it's not recognized for much of that support. They did try and support some families with special needs who applied through the National Council of Persons with Disabilities. And I believe a subset of those who applied did get something. I'm not sure how much, how significant it was, but there was something that was happening at that time. We were affected in the sense that we had to close for a month. Immediately we had to close. We put up provisions for telehealth, trained the staff immediately. We are limited on laptops and we I seemed to be like a tech person for quite some time, fixing laptops and doing all that kind of stuff. But we managed running our sessions online and they were very successful. Some of our clients have come back, a lot have not yet. And we are running on a smaller scale at the moment because of social distancing. So where we could have four or five sessions in a room, right now there's only strictly two sessions in each given room. So there, those are some of the challenges we're dealing with at the moment, but we have learned how to do telehealth through all this and we're still going strong in Tanzania because there is no coronavirus according to what is officially given out. There are no restrictions, there is no social distancing, there is no there is no COVID. So we're trying to get Tanzania sessions back to where they were. It's still not 100%, but we're almost there. And that they're recovering from closing for a while as well. So what's happened over in Sorum? So uh, we, we still closed. And as everyone knows, uh, the cases of COVID are on continuously on Greece. 
and uh, almost doubling every day the previous day so the situation is pretty bad right now and uh, we clo- we closed school in march and we haven't reopened as yet the first two months we were still like you know we never thought that this is going to go so bad and as i shared earlier that we have 170 students so we have variety of uh, you know uh, the services also from early intervention to the vocational programs and online uh, i mean the 10th and 12th so we we got on to the online programs whatever we had with definitely we do not have too many you know uh, laptops and using all that resources we had for the from the phones whatsapp and going online programs and you know sending the work through whatsapp and receiving the work on the whatsapp that's what we did but we did lose about you know 100 students who were not paying so we still have some kind of fee coming from very dedicated parents and it's very challenging to pay the staff also because we've we've done with all our reserves whatever we had in the first 3 months and um, yeah but then i would say the good point is like we were able to encourage parents and uh, the one that we are now together is actually uh, we having a very strong bond amongst ourselves and also with the parents so that's one good point that happened but definitely as part as the when we want to talk about the financial part that's really very challenging and me being a parent also to a 21 year old almost 21 year old i act exactly knew you know what could we could do my son is not very high functioning so we were able to design we were able to talk about what kind of programs we should be starting you know where we can engage them so we have online assemblies we have online classes we have all those things which we keep working on it with the feedbacks and saying like oh this worked and this didn't work so we are on a path and we are on the learning uh, you know path ourselves and probably we all got to know technologically more closer because when we said oh i don't know about this we're all getting closer to it that like without technology we really can't survive so yeah. overall financially very bad it's very difficult for the students as well to stay back and we often every day you know i personally deal with two or three parents to say that oh this went wrong that today the child broke tv and today this happened and you know this is what because they can't still go out and we don't have any support from the government not even i mean like not at all so that's where we are molly i would like to add something so In Ecuador, we actually were in quarantine almost four months uh, that nobody will be able to leave home. But I wanted to add to what Sangita was saying. The first month where parents are uh, probably were not working or people were adapting to telework, it was easy to help our parents via online. So you will do a session in the morning or in the afternoon. But the second month, even though the parents had the will and were very anxious and, and positive energy, You can see that parents start saying I have to work from home from 8 to 5 and you know and and I don't know what to do with Molly because Molly you know she doesn't sit down she's only she doesn't know how to play what should I do so I think that was the hardest part because the first month you kind of adapted to parent schedule you can do sessions in the morning in the afternoon but once the two parents had to go back to work in home that was the hard part at least for us and i believe for, for a lot of people again we were in quarantine for almost four months so that was the hardest part so we had to accommodate sessions at 7 p.m. or sometimes we will log in in the morning to see if maybe we sing to the child they will like pay attention to us so the parent can work a little bit and i have to give a lot of credit to the parents because some parents put their work aside at least for an hour in the morning to join us and um, i think that was the hardest part once the parents had to go back to work from home but what can you do absolutely we've had a couple more people join us since we started we have kaki here i'll let you introduce yourself kaki where are you from where do you work <laughs> hi i'm kaki i'm from dominican republic and i work at centro cap we serve small group of students on the spectrum ranging from age 3 to 16 right now. Amazing. Amazing. And Avis, you just joined us. Where are you joining us from? I'm from Rwanda. I'm the founder of Silver Bells, a center in Rwanda. We deal with children with mental disability and 90% of our students are autistic. 
and we enroll from two years to 16, but we also have one adult that comes in in the evening who is 22. Got it. Excellent. And we were talking, Avis and Kaki, just about what impact has COVID had on your work? So Avis, if we could start with you, what has it meant for you? It has really affected our performance, has affected families, most families. Most parents have lost their jobs and we having over 38 children. Now at the moment we have 20 children. Some cannot enroll their children. And in these 20 children that we have, six are new, so which means we'd be having 14. So others cannot afford because of the situation. And of course, we had also to terminate some of the contracts of our staff because we would not afford to pay them. Even those that are enrolled are not paying, like they are, they are paying in installments, which is hard for the center and hard for the parents as well. And also because of the situation, even parents fear to, in, to bring their children to the center, and yet they, they really need the service because they fear they might be contaminated. So it's a big problem. And Kaki, how about in the Dominican Republic? So it's been difficult mostly because we had to close for a while. A lot of our parents have either lost their jobs or are working from home or are both working and don't have somewhere to send their kids for school. A lot of parents are really scared of bringing their kids out of their homes. So we've had to offer home services in order to decrease that kind of contamination with travels and and things like that. We're also on curfew. So it's been difficult to, our working hours have been limited because we can't, um, we have to be home by seven and the traffic has been a lot crazier since everybody is moving at the same times now. The country is kind of getting back into their groove, but we're still struggling with a lot of issues surrounding the schools because most of our kids aren't in school right now just because schools are doing like virtual school and our kids won't sit for five or 10 minutes in order to listen to a lesson. And our parents don't have the time to stay with the kids in order for them to implement the lesson. So that's been a big struggle. But we're moving forward. It's been progress slowly. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've all had to adjust what our idea of meeting our goals in 2020 has been. You know, we've gone from our biggest year yet and this and more skill core people than ever before and adding partners to we're just going to we're just we're just going to stay in one piece. (laughs) That's going to be our our big goal. Michael, how about you? What's happening in China? How did COVID impact your work and what's happening now? Okay, so uh, yes, the pandemic uh, started from China, and uh, we actually suffered a lot from that. We just uh, finished the decoration for our, one of our new centers in another province. From uh, uh, actually, that's finished decoration uh, around January this January, and then uh, we have uh, the pandemic problems, and then uh, we have to wait it for. Uh, almost four months to start the new center. And also during the pandemic period in China, we did a lot of work for the online training to parents for the family training. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we can keep keep all the teachers, keep them working. And we also have a chance to give kind of support to continuous support to families. And so from this, uh, the end of this May, we almost all restarted. Right now, now we even don't have to wear masks in public. But right now, we still have a lot of uh, issues. So one of the issues is that uh, some parents, uh, because of the lockdown, the long-term lockdown that many parents, they either lost their jobs or they, they, they have less, much less income. So for some parents, they have to stop or they have to pause the, the training. So that's being said, we have, uh, we have less students. But meanwhile, the cost for something like uh, property rental or for salary, that's not something uh, less. So we just need to do uh, more marketing uh, just to try to get better financial balance. 
So th that's the biggest challenge right now. But things just are getting uh, better and better because most of the business restarted. And so uh, we can see something better, especially from this month and next month. So they will be able to bring us back to normal. Good. Excellent. And I know a lot of you, um, Avis, you had just moved into a new center, right? Pooja had just moved into a new center. Mafer, you had just opened a new location, right? So it, the, the timing of this in terms of where everybody was with their growth was really challenging. Rani, share with us what's happening in Indonesia. Okay, so I think it's because the coronavirus, so it's been more than six months from March, we closed the center yeah. until right now. So we are still using online method. And we, we focus to give the instruction for the parents because the parents should know how to run the programs. And also we change the programs into the independent scale. So it's more useful and easy to parents to have to study with the kids while during the stay at home. <laughs> and yeah, we, I think we don't have any difference this from the other country that uh, the challenge is uh, the financial is also and yeah it's same <laughs> the other side thing. Yeah. yeah yeah I knew you did work with the parents always it seemed to really benefit you for during this time is that being said before we sign off here this morning. I just want to, first of all, let me see if there's any questions that have come up. We have people watching. We do have a question for the Dominican Republic. Were you impacted by Hurricane Laura at all? I don't remember the path of that storm exactly. Was that the hurricane like three weeks ago? I think so. Yeah. We So parts of the country had um, some impact okay. from the hurricane. There was a lot of rain. There was some damage done. It wasn't as bad as we were expecting, honestly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we also had a question that was, are you concerned right now about natural disasters in that region? I mean, like, always, I guess. But hurricane season is, like, I don't want to jinx it, but <laughs> <laughs> it's part of living here. Like, we always have hurricane season we always have the potential of having big hurricanes, of having earthquakes, but not more than usual right now. Yeah. Got it. Excellent. So what I'd love to hear from you all is what good things have come out of this? What has been something that you've surprised yourself? You know, I spoke earlier just about your resiliency and how we're not surprised at all that all of you are intact and that's just because we know you and who you really are. But has there been anything for you that has, you've surprised yourself? It's been actually a positive thing amidst all of, all of this. Anyone can start. Ronnie. Okay. So, uh, ah, um, so, uh, the thing that, I'm impressed about myself is become more independent, more confidence to using online conference. Like we start to Instagram live and also sharing uh, with the parents all around the Indonesian place from Zoom because some parents who keep their kids just stay at home, uh, confused how to handle the kids, right? So we think that we want to help them and we share how uh, Rumah Tiara is until right now handling the kids. And also I'm so impressed about our parents because before COVID, they don't believe themselves that they can handling the kids. But now since May, we have a lot of positive report from the parents and also from the educators too, that the parents like 
proud themselves because they can having uh, the kids at home. And we also make a report from March until August because that's uh, our semester. Uh, we make it different from the last term uh, because we don't have a lot of data for taking how the kids are uh, going well from their home. So uh, we make it into a into a like what's notes and also what's the positive the parents do yeah. and also what we want to change for the future okay. and that report make our parents cry because they <laughs> because they don't like they don't expect that we will uh, give them that report so it makes me like grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Puja, what's something positive that has come out? We have a few questions as well, but I'm gonna we'll we'll break up this question with, with these. Go ahead, Puja. Obviously, just like everyone else, telehealth has been a big advantage. We've had a lot of calls over the years with you. So it wasn't completely new, but training your staff and bringing them aboard was very good. It's something that we've been looking at, but we never had the push to do it. So I guess we can say it was the push to get that done. We've also been in connection with a lot of parents. We've seen a lot of parents working with the kids, which has also been nice. We live in a country where most of the kids are looked after caregivers because parents are both working and, you know, schedules and all those things. So that has been nice. I think those are the main things that we learned out of this. And obviously we're learning that we are survivors. We're going to get out of this the other side way better than we went in. So, yeah. 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 Awesome. I love that. Yes, sir. How about you? What have you learned? As I mentioned before, the reflection that were forced to us by this pandemic changed the way we perceive the organization, NAMAI. Coronavirus forced us to look to a lot of areas in NAMAI that we were usually overlooked it. So now we are look at we look at NAMAI as a living organization that need health, need growth, need to be taken care of. Yeah. So it can take care of other people. And one more thing that we will use it for the next few years, whenever we will feel that we have a lot of work, we have a lot of challenge, that will be nothing compared to coronavirus pandemic. So it will be always a motivator for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. We had, we were looking at um, last year, some of you remember we had a travel agent snafu and it was about this time last year that we realized that we had a challenge with our travel agent for our plane tickets for October. And it's like, I would give anything right now <laughs> to have that be the biggest challenge in some way. Like, that's so easy. So, yeah, amazing. So we do have some questions. Um, and then I want to make sure we hear from everybody. And I think, I think we've answered this. But have you found that parents are more willing to learn programming and behavior management with their children being home more and with them spending more time? Well, I don't know who's going, but I want to say something. Um, our parents are on our programming in Central Enigma. Parents are always involved. Um, Molly knows the parents are involved once a week. So that transition from our regular life to having a adjusted life by COVID-19, it was not really hard for our parents. Even when we started telehealth sessions, um, they were pretty familiar with the programming. Obviously, there were little things that we had to introduce and teach them something like reinforcing and how why do you have to reinforce in that very in that last 15 seconds when a child has the behavior or what should they ignore what should they reinforce but other than that it was really easy for us again our parents before COVID and post COVID, they are involved in sessions once a week they assist the center 45 minutes and they get monthly sessions with us where they where we explain them why we're doing what programming and why is a prerequisite skill. So 
in at least for Central Enigma, it was not really hard. They were very excited. They were very scared too. They're, so you can see parents, um, their hands shaking um, when they were doing the sessions. But it was a good experience so, for them. Yeah, you've had an exemplary parent involvement. I know a lot of you have been just really amazing. And part of that, I think, right, is that where you are in the world, the parents have to be involved. In a lot of cases, they are these kids only advocates, especially, you know, I remember working Puja with you in Kenya years and years ago. It was like it was you and a few parents, you know, and now there's a lot more happening in Kenya, but they really they've had to show up and there was another question that is, have you all been talking with each other during this time and supporting each other? Does anyone want to speak to that? I feel like we have actually had that opportunity, which has been great. We had those sessions with Rachel that were really cool. And then I was able to do a, a live with, uh, with Maria and we were able to like do a, like, I don't know, just talk to to parents about everything that was going on and some things that we could do. Yeah, we have been able to collaborate. Yeah, we were all super fortunate because thanks to Global Summit, we're not just faces on a little screen, right? We've all all been in each other's space and met each other. Yeah. Yeah, Rachel led some really powerful, amazing sessions with our partners early on when this first happened. You know, the way that things sort of happened at the Global Autism Project is we realized we weren't going to be able to travel to China in January for our February trips. And we thought, oh, wow, this is, wow, this is a lot. This is not something that we've ever planned on. We had two or maybe three, we had two teams going to China, I think at that point. And then some of you may remember, and some of you may not, certainly all of our partners do, we canceled all of the travel in February. We canceled that travel before things were being canceled. In hindsight, we're very glad we canceled that travel. And when we did that, we knew that now this organization is going to have a very significant hit, both in terms of financially and having to organize logistically, right, how we're going to move forward. And so at that point, we pivoted to we're going to run an in-person session in New York City and we're going to run it in late March. And then we had to cancel the in-person session in New York City in late March. And at that point, we said, "Okay, you know, we need to batten down the hatches. Now we have no idea where, you know, it's almost like as if we're all in a boat and the wind is coming from every direction and we can adjust our sails only so many times. And then at some point, we have to all lower our sails and just stay safe. And that's what we've done as a Global Autism Project family. You know, we've been in communication a few times a month. And then if you count the WhatsApp group almost every day, you know, we've been in communication as as the Global Autism Project. And of course, we shifted our gears to the Partner Relief Fund, which thank you all so much, you know, for, for supporting that. But I want to get back to some of the good things. I don't know if we'll have a chance to hear from everyone. So... So let's see. Somebody else, go ahead. Some of the good things that have that have happened. So as I said earlier, like the most important for what, what happened with uh, us at Sodom was uh, developing stronger bonds amongst ourselves and also with the parents. So for us, like when we discovered when we were posting the work on the WhatsApp groups or when we were having the Zoom online classes, the parents were able to, you know, reinforce and encourage other other children also, other students also. So I could see a very strong bond developing amongst the parents, amongst the staff, which I think we would have not, you know, got otherwise because parents usually come to attend the parent-teacher meeting and ask about the student and just say hello to someone. But this was everyday interaction with every parent and, you know, every child. They were encouraging each other. They were forming a strong bond. And for us also, when we had like no money, I think amongst the staff also, we started supporting each other. How can we do better? Which I think was a, you know, super most important point for all of us. So today also, we all try and think about like, what can we do now? to, you know, um, work in a in a better way to provide to students. It's not at all about now money. It's not about like we have to charge pains. It's like how we can, you know, uh, prove to be productive and uh, create value in the community that we are in. Awesome. 
Yeah, and those of you who who don't know Sangeeta, she is, as she said, a mom of an incredible, almost 21-year-old. Every time you say his age, I cannot believe it. I always think of him as 12 when I met him, I think, right? 11 or 12. And has just been, you know, this mom in India who went to the ends of the world to try to get services for her kid and then created services in Chandigarh, created quality services, and has been such an amazing parent advocate and just somebody who just takes a stand for these kids and these families in a way that just is so incredible and in a place where it's not always easy to do that. So maybe we can link to when you spoke at the UN about your experience, that might be kind of cool, but yeah, I mean, every single person on this screen, I know zoom calls all start to look alike after a while (laughs) in a lot of ways, but this is the entire globe and the people who are on this screen right now are just the most incredible humans I know in the world. And certainly when it comes to advocating and caring for the autistic population and really just creating a world that works for these kids. So it's really, really amazing. We don't have a lot of time left, but if someone else wants to share what positive things have come of this. Yeah, during this pandemic, it was really hard for us to do the online therapy. Our parents encouraged us. And the positive part is that even the government realized our services. And at the moment, all schools are locked down. They are still in the lockdown, but they they really allowed us to work, which is a very big thing. Yeah. So for us, we are operating, but all schools are closed. Yeah. At least now the government can recognize centers. Yeah. 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 I, you reminded me of something, Eva, actually, when you talk about the government is being allowed. We fall under a center for a rehabilitation center, according to our paperwork. But we were actually raided by COVID police and harassed for serving at this time because They kept insisting, well, if you're teaching the children, you must be an education facility. We showed them all evidence showing that we're not education, we're a center, we're doing speech therapy, ABA, occupational therapy, and we were were harassed a lot. Sorry. Sorry. So that's one of the big challenges actually at the moment that people are taking advantage of. There's a lot of... I wish we had gotten to hear from every single one of you. We will do another live call with everybody um, here in the Facebook group. Thank you so much for those of you who participated, who have shared, who have supported our partners. We are going to link to the Partner Relief Fund. Um, You've heard, you know, directly from them, some of the challenges that they're dealing with right now. And, um, you know, we can really make a difference right now, which is, which is really exciting. So, I just want to thank you all so much for being here. I know you're navigating so much right now with your centers and with COVID and with the parents and, you know, in an ordinary year and an ordinary day, you have a lot that you're, that you're contending with. And this has been another layer. And I have to say, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it would have been easy to say too hard and, Never mind, you know, and because of you, um, that's not oh, hi. <laughs> because of you, we're here, you know, and we're so grateful to be here and to have all of you. And you've been, as always, just incredible, just inspiring is sort of not the right word, but just I've been really just moved by by how much you're a catalyst for change in your communities within the paradigm that we're living in now. So thank you all. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being with your kids. Thank you, Molly. And we are here today because of you. (laughs) I'm here because of you. That's all. (laughs) But I just, I love, I love that we get to, that we get to be together as a team. I love that we did Global Summit last year. So we all got to meet each other and know that this is... (laughs) 
This is um, an incredible, incredible family to be a part of. So thank you all. And this will be up live on Facebook. So people will be able to watch it and continue to comment and engage. So thank you for being here. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. After every partner call, my heart is filled with hope, gratitude, and a strong sense of connection. As Molly said, our partners are some of the most passionate and resourceful humans we know. These dedicated changemakers continue to inspire us with their adaptability and perseverance. Despite countless hurdles, they are not giving up. They all share our vision of creating a world where every person with autism can reach their potential no matter where they live. Since the start of the COVID-19 crisis, our partners have been adapting their services to support some of the most vulnerable children and their families. The unfortunate reality is that many of them are receiving little help from their governments, or none at all. The good news is that you can help ensure their schools continue running services by making a donation today. 100% of your donations to the Partner Relief Fund go directly to our partners who need it most. You'll be supporting internet access for remote teaching, educational materials, and protective equipment. You can make a difference today by supporting families and their children in our partners' communities. Donations can be made at globalautismproject.org. Thanks for listening. Take care. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.